And so our next speaker is Neepak Vasich, who is a PhD candidate in EECS, that's Electrical Engineering Computer Science, also known as Course 6 for everyone. Hello everyone, I'm Deepak, uh, I'm a PhD student at MIT. Uh, this is a uh, joint work with Microsoft, which was done at Microsoft with a bunch of amazing researchers. Uh, it's a project called Farm Beats, uh, which is an AI and IoT platform for data-driven agriculture. As a lot of you might know, by 2050, we're going to need double the amount of food than what we have today. And that's mainly because of two reasons. One, the population of the world keeps on increasing and it's going to be around 10 billion by 2050. And two, because we have upward social mobility. So as people get richer, we're going to need more food per person. And as we need more food, the resources that we have to produce that food are shrinking. The amount of water that we have available is going down. Uh, the land that's fit for agriculture is shrinking because cities and towns are expanding and taking up that space. And while we shoot for that growth, we also want to be mindful of our environment. Agriculture as an industry is one of the biggest contributors of greenhouse gases. So we want to achieve this growth in a sustainable way. Clearly, this is a big challenge for us as humanity. And much like the 70s when we had the first uh, agricultural revolution, we're looking for a disruption in this space. And fortunately for us, uh, there's been a lot of research on this topic uh, from a lot of uh, people in agriculture, chemistry, physics. And one of the most promising techniques today is something called data-driven agriculture. And again, this is not work uh, that I do or we, we at FarmBees do. It's more, work, more of the work in the agricultural space over the last three decades. And let me tell you what data-driven agriculture is. So when you talk about traditional farming, right, you treat your entire farm as one single unit. So if I give you X amount of water, you're going to take this water and apply it uniformly across your field. What data-driven agriculture says is that it's not the right way to go about it. Instead, what you should be doing is to map your field. You need to create a map of your field that can show you the exact amount of moisture in each individual part. So for example, this part is more dry and this part is more wet. And then you want to treat them accordingly. So if a part is more dry, you want to give it more water. And you can imagine doing this for other farm inputs, not just water, say pH, fertilizer, nitrogen, so on and so forth. And by doing that, what uh, research current, uh, currently has shown is that you can, by doing that, you can achieve improved yields, you can reduce your input costs, and you can also improve sustainability. So that's great. I told you a problem that we need more food within some constraints. And I gave you a solution, data-driven agriculture. Why don't we do that today? And one of the biggest reasons is the high cost of data collection. So if you're a farmer today, and if you want to do data-driven agriculture, you have two options. You can either collect all this data manually, so you take a sensor, plug it into the soil, measure a value, you walk a few steps, you do it again, and you keep doing that for your entire field, which can stretch miles. Clearly, that's not feasible. Your other option is to use really, really expensive sensors. So if you want to measure something as simple as soil moisture, so we were at an expo last year, and we were looking at all these soil moisture sensors, and the cheapest sensors that are connected that we could find were $8,000 for five sensors. And a farmer might need tens of those. So that's not enough, that's a lot of investment for a farmer to make. And that's the problem that we're going to try to solve with farm beets. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about a system called Farm Beats, which is an end-to-end -end system that can enable agricultural sensing at two orders of magnitude lower cost. So at a very, very high level, the way to think about Farm Beats is to think of it as a fabric or an ether that spreads across your farm. You can plug in any kinds of sensors. You can plug in drones, you can plug in cameras, you can plug in moisture, pH, nitrogen sensors. And at the end of it, what you get is farm services, which is, say, data-driven agriculture. And you can access these services on your PC, on your smartphone, on your laptop. OK, so how does this black, ball, black box called Farm Beats work? So when we started doing Farm Beats, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we faced as researchers who work at MIT is the lack of internet connectivity on the farm. So most farms uh, are located in rural areas, uh, which are sparsely populated. The cellular uh, companies don't have enough incentive to establish cellular base stations on those areas, so you cannot rely on cellular connectivity. In fact, the nearest connection to internet that we could find was the farmer's home, which is typically a few miles away. And this distance is obstructed by crops, canopies, all sorts of rugged environments. So our first challenge was to take the internet connection that exists at farmer's home and extend it to the sensors that are on the field. And our solution to this problem was to use TV white spaces. 
So if you're not familiar with what TV white spaces are, uh, these are essentially free parts of the TV spectrum that are not being used by TV channels. Uh, they are more available in rural areas because there's a lot of soft free TV channels. So if you turn on your TV, turn to some channel and see white noise, that's a free TV channel. And uh, off late, you can use them for data communications. And much like your TV uh, videos, you can stream high volumes of data and you can stream them over, over long distances. So these networks can stretch tens of miles. And what's more interesting uh, is that in rural areas uh, where these farms are typically located, you have very less TV transmission, so you have a lot of free TV white spaces. So you can use these free chunks of spectrum which can be as large as 100 megahertz just for your data needs. So what we do is we take the connection that exists in the farmer's home and extend it to the farm and establish a base station using TV white spaces. And now on the farm, it's more like a Wi-Fi router. You can plug in any kinds of sensors. And these sensors can be cheap because they don't have need expensive communication technologies. They can just operate over your standard Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, like any technology of your choice. Okay, so now what we have done at this point is taken the internet connection that exists here, extend it to the farm so that we have connectivity for the sensors. The second big challenge uh, for us is the number of sensors that's required. So for data-driven farming, what you want to do is to create a dense precision map of your field that looks like this. You want to measure the moisture at each location on your farm. And to do that, you're potentially going to need a lot of sensors. But that's not practical. First of all, it's really expensive to deploy a large volume of sensors, and there's also maintenance costs on top. And then it's also not practical. If you're a farmer, you have to drive a bullock cart or a tractor through your farm, and that's going to be really hard for you to do if you have sensors lying around all over the place. So what you ideally want to do is to use a small number of sensors and yet be able to create a dense precision map like that. And our idea there was to use drones. So drones <laughs> of late are really cheap. You can get one for less than $1,000 from DJI. They're fairly automatic. They can cover large areas quickly and they can give you visual feedback. So what we did was to take this visual feedback and use it to extrapolate sensor information from a small number of sensors. And let me tell you how we do that on a very, very high level. So we take a drone, we send it over the farm to take a video, then we compress that video into a high level panoramic overview of the farm. This is just a screenshot of how a farm looks like at one given time. And then we combine it with a sparse deployment of sensors using tools from machine learning and computer vision to create precision maps like these. So this is a moisture map of the field, shows you exactly how the moisture is varying across this farm. And for creating this map, we need a very small number of sensors, but we can interpolate these values using the, uh, the visual features. And by doing that, we can extrapolate the value from a small number of sensors over a large area. Cool. So now we are collecting all this data from cameras, drones, uh, moisture, temperature, pH, etc. How do we process this data and where does this processing happen? Because, so one, one, one simple idea is to send all of this data to the cloud, similar to how, say, Amazon Alexa or Google Home would do that for you. Send this data to the cloud, the cloud will process this data or return a response. But the problem for farmers is that this connection from the home to this cloud is typically very weak. So it's, it's not always a broadband connection. And even if this connection is strong enough, it's very prone to outages. So they can be thunderstorms, they can be floods, and this network might be down for weeks. We were actually uh, deploying in New York, and uh, we could not access our system for one week uh, last year. And that, and that happens very often. So our solution to this problem was to use the PC that already exists in farmer's home or on farmer's office for regular accounting purposes, and transform it into an intelligent edge. And this edge device, can combine all of the sensor data locally into small summaries that can be sent to the cloud, and it can provide time-sensitive services to the farmer on the farm itself. And the cloud can then deliver long-term analytics or cross-farm analytics depending on these summaries. So to give you an overview of, the, of how the gateway looks like, uh, this is a summary. So essentially, there are all these sensors on the left that can interface with the gateway using multiple technologies like MQTT, FTT, TCP, all these protocols. And then uh, this gateway itself can run services locally, which can be accessed on a web server offline. And then we can also do active component migration between the edge and the cloud, depending on what, what type of communication we can enable. 
So that's all about farm beats on a very high level. I'm going to talk about deployments in a bit. So just to, uh, to conclude this part of the talk, we have drones and uh, sensors on the field that can communicate to this TV white space base station using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or LoRa, uh, which can talk about over TV white spaces to the, to the gateway where uh, a lot of the services and a lot of the processing happens. And then this gateway will com compress this data into summaries which are on the cloud. So the farmer can access data both on the cloud and on the local gateway. And in the United States, we have two deployments. Uh, one of them is in Washington State in Carnation, and the other one is in upstate New York. Uh, the New York farm is relatively large, it's 2,000 acres. Uh, the Washington State farm is like five acres. And uh, we use multiple sensors. We use DJI drones, uh, particle photons with all kinds of sensors uh, and IP cameras. And the cloud component is provided by Azure uh, Storage and IoT Suite. Uh, so this is an example of a panorama from the New York farm. Uh, this is just a visual overview. It's about five acres in size. Uh, it can actually reveal very interesting things that a farmer can spot, but not me, and I'm going to point some of them to you. So there's a water puddle on the farm that a farmer could spot, and this is important because if you don't treat this water puddle now, the field is going to be not cultivable for the next season. Uh, they can also spot, say, cow excreta, which is going to become manure for the next season. You can see cow herds, stray cows, uh, all kinds of things. So this uh, panorama is actually very rich. It's just uh, not high resolution enough on the screen. And this is a different panoramic, panoramic overview for uh, our farm in Washington State. Uh, we use this also to create some precision map that I showed you earlier. So this is, for example, a moisture map. Uh, the scale is one to four, where one is dry and four is moist. Uh, one of the most interesting pieces of this uh, overview is that we did not have any sensors on the top left corner of this field, where you can see it's clearly moist, but we could still predict that it's moist based on our machine learning tools. So there's no deployed sensors on this top left. And similarly, we could do pH. Uh, so pH, again, like four is acidic, seven is neutral, as a lot of you might know. Uh, and for most crops, you want to be in the six to seven range. If your soil is too acidic, your crop production is going to go down. And we could tell the farmer that a major part of this field was acidic so that he could treat it with lime and uh, improve it for the next season. Uh, a very a brief overview of some of our evaluation. Uh, we, we measured the accuracy of the farm beads as opposed to the sensor. We are measuring it against the least count of the sensor for temperature, pH, and moisture. Uh, and these are the mean errors, which are much smaller or e almost equal to the sensors themselves. So our precision maps are almost as accurate as, as the real sensors that we are measuring with. Cool. And after we deployed farm beads, uh, farmers have used it for other applications and not just data-driven agriculture, for example, for tracking cows in barns. So we just put a camera, we can track cows, we see their motion uh, throughout the day. So to conclude, uh, I talked to you about farm beads, which is an end-to-end -end IoT system for data-driven agriculture. Uh, it's a tool to enhance farmer and farm productivity, and farmers have used it for other applications beyond just uh, data-driven farming. And actually, uh, I want to thank uh, two farmers who actually uh, initiated this test with us, uh, Sean Strotman in Washington State and Mark and Kristen Kimmel in New York. And to, this is the deployment status today. Uh, we have uh, farmers in United States, India, New Zealand, and Africa piloting this. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll take questions later, I guess. Okay.